I'm very happy to see you all here today for this very special event. Um, Gil Adajar is here not simply as a speaker in our regular interdisciplinary lecture series, but as CMES's first ever distinguished visitor. He's so distinguished. At the suggestion of CMES faculty Saba Mahmoud, who is here also, um, in the Department of Anthropology, and Anthropology graduate students Candice Lukasik and Basit Iqbal, the CMES enticed Gil out to Berkeley for 10 days, during which time he has led two workshops, held endless office hours, and generally made himself available to meet with interested scholars on campus. Um, this was an experiment for the CMES to bring visitors for a longer period of time so that we can really engage with them on a deeper level than we're able to with these kind of one-off lectures when sometimes they come in the afternoon and they're gone the next day. But I think we can safely say that this experiment has been a resounding like, success. Uh, we're very thankful to Saba, Candice, and Basit for leading this effort, but especially to Gil himself who has been so accommodating and such a pleasure to have around the CMES. Thank you, Gil, for giving us so much of your time. Um, Gil hardly needs an introduction here, but I'll give a short one anyway. He's one of Berkeley's own. He received his PhD uh, from UC Berkeley in comparative literature, and he's now a professor of religion, comparative literature, and Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African studies at Columbia University, a title that, however broad, only partially covers his vast array of research interests and expertise, which include Muslim-Jewish relations, rhetoric, European intellectual history, the surveillance state, and the list goes on. He's published widely. His books include The Jew, The Arab, A History of the Enemy, and Semites, Race, Religion, Literature, and Blood, A Critique of Christianity. And he obviously has a knack for coming up with catchy book titles. Um, today, Gil will speak about Sparta and Gaza, another wonderful title, uh, and I can't wait to hear what it's all about. Please join me in welcoming Gil Anijar to the CMS. Thank you, uh, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Saba. Thank you, Basit and Candice. Uh, I've had a great time. It's, um, I, in fact, I feel it's continuing since most of the people are here. I actually had a conversation with, and so um, um, it, it helps with the nervousness in presenting uh, uh, something that. Um, seems to be growing, and I'm not sure where it's going to go. I'm not sure it makes sense, but hopefully uh, some of it will. Um, I, I do have um, a subtitle, and I'm not sure it's going to uh, help, but I'll say it anyway. So Sparta and Gaza, the weapon is the medium. What is a weapon? Where and when does it begin? What inference from the work to the maker, from the deed to the doer, from the ideal to the one who needs it, from every manner of thinking and valuing to the commanding need behind it, can be made with regard to it? That is, can a weapon be, should it be, distinguished from a tool, a hammer, say, or a knife, or from the doer and the deed, from the one making, holding, or using it, thinking, knowing, and imagining it, writing it. Indeed, could a weapon be thought for the moment, as a moment, essential or not, in the history of media and of technology, the history of writing, perhaps? Could it even be otherwise? Is not a weapon, to begin with, a means or a medium? And if so, is it a means of inscription or of destruction? Prior to offering any theory, much less a philosophy of weapons, if such has ever been attempted or even deemed possible, the Bible famously describes how Cain rose, as it were, to the occasion. Having learned the hard way, or so it seems, that as Marx put it, the weapon of criticism certainly cannot replace the criticism of weapons, Cain was unwittingly preparing to receive the inscription, the mark, named after him, soon to be the first subject of a unilateral disarmament agreement, stripped as he was of his ability to till the ground and make his mark upon it. 
Part of his punishment was that Cain was thereby barred from accessing the force or power of the ground, which had earlier sustained and strengthened him. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. Lo tosef tet kocha lach. Like his human, all too human father, Cain is a child of the ground, Adama or humus, if there ever was one. He is a tiller of the ground, Oved Adama. It is from that ground that he had earlier given God an offering, promptly and arbitrarily disregarded, from that same ground that he rose to kill his herder brother, and it is that very same ground, Adama, which God pointed out to him had then opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And so it was that Cain was cursed from the ground, Arur Ata Min A Adama, a fugitive and a wanderer, driven away from and onto the face of the earth, or ground, Me'al Pne A Adama, sentenced to never make another mark on the ground. The murder thus constitutes an early and multifarious inscription, a series of inscriptions, that bringing about and auguring destruction, demand to be read from the ground up. For the ground itself, enabling condition and instrument of execution, voicing judgment and inflicting punishment, turns on Cain as a means of protracted destruction. It plays on the alternative between saving and destroying, a surface that once a source of nourishment and a book of open furrows ultimately refuses him further inscription. Crime and punishment, or as Gilles Deleuze would not have it, cruelty and judgment. But what then was the weapon, the first or earliest weapon? Was it the stick or the stone, the pen, the sword, or the plowshare? The book, the book, as opposed to the ground, or to Kubrick, or even Hitchcock, who both went for the bone, the book does not say. Surely weapons, but note for what it's worth that the word used to function as a verb as well, weapons have a determined if complex relation to the violence of the letter, to the trace, to memory, and to the possibility of erasure. As Jacques Derrida writes, if the trace arche phenomenon of memory, which must be thought before the opposition of nature and culture, animality and humanity, etc., if the trace belongs to the very movement of signification, then signification is a priori written, whether inscribed or not, in one form or another, in a sensible and spatial element that is called exterior." End of quote. From within the cycle that links Cain's rise or stance to the marks on the ground and on his head and the screams of the blood, Weapons sensibly affect spaces that might indeed be called exterior. They irrevocably belong to the movement of signification, which must, must include its vanishing or tracing. Before Heidegger, who had much to say about tools, but very little, if more infamously, about death-dealing machines, even atomic or industrial ones, Hegel had recognized that when it comes to weapons, cognition may be secondary to inscription incision and decision, the separation instituted by distinguishing marks and the ability to cut and divide. The distinguishing marks, Unterscheidungsmerksmale, of animals, are taken from their claws and teeth. For in point of fact, it is not only cognition that thereby distinguishes, Unterscheidet, one animal from another, but each animal itself separates itself from others thereby. The steel scheidet sich dadurch selbst ab. By means, of these by means of these weapons, I'm still quoting Hegel, by means of these weapons, it, the animal, maintains itself in its independence and in its detachment from the generality. End of quote. Between animality and humanity, Douglas Emlen rightly devotes a long book to animal weapons. Between the fox and the hedgehog, the mole and the serpent, and between Athens, and Jerusalem, weapons also precede and exceed the question of media and technology. Marshall McLuhan, who surprisingly dedicated an entire chapter of understanding media to weapons, insisted that they too are extensions of man. 
He meant man as man. Accordingly, he saw as natural and fitting the assertion that, I quote, the power of letters as agents of aggressive order and precision should be expressed as extensions of the dragon's teeth. Teeth are emphatically visual in their lineal order. Letters are not only like teeth visually, but the power to put teeth into the business of empire building is manifest in our Western history." End of quote. Offensive or defensive, projective or protective, weapons are means of inscription and of destruction. They have something to do with speed, yes, and with linear writing as well as with its end. Weapons take form and they undo all forms. Old and new, they function as extensions that are encased, for better or for worse, within existing forms, living forms. Weapons are, in other words, citations. The oppositions they generate or reiterate, nature and culture, animality and humanity, along with the transformations they compel us to think from the bone to the bomb, constitute sedimentations that must therefore parallel in complex ways this event, non-event, famously described by Derrida as the end of the book, but perhaps more aptly understood, Derrida himself suggested, as the destruction of the book. I read Derrida. The end of linear writing is indeed the end of the book, even if even today, even if, even today, it is within the form of a book that new writings, literary or theoretical, allow themselves to be, for better or for worse, encased. It is less a question of confiding new writings to the envelope of a book than of finally reading what wrote itself between the lines in the volumes. That is why, beginning to write without the line, one begins also to reread past writing according to a different organization of space." End of quote. New writing, old weapons, or vice versa. And we shall have to return, of course, to ancient books of mass destruction. For as Derrida also makes clear the violence of the letter, the destruction of the book, double genitive, the destruction of the book by the book and of the book. The destruction of the book is less about novelty than about rereading past writing according to a different organization of space. The violence of the letter, the letter as weapon, if you will, belongs to an age of empire, a certain space age, no doubt it is our age. Ray Chow calls it, rightly I think, the age of the world target. But it is one that must be thought according to broader templates that include philosophy and law, war and punishment, technology and animality, and with an altogether different sense of science, therefore, and another concept of history as well. It is a peculiarity of our epoch, Derrida writes, that at the moment when the phoneticization of writing, the historical origin and structural possibility of philosophy as of science, the condition of the episteme, begins to lay hold on world culture, science, in its advancements, can no longer be satisfied with it. This inadequation had always already begun to make its presence felt, but today something lets it appear as such, allows it a kind of takeover without our being able to translate this novelty into clear-cut notions of mutation, explicitation, accumulation, revolution, or tradition. These values belong no doubt to the system whose dislocation is today presented as such. They describe the styles of a historical movement which was meaningful, like the concept of history itself, only within a logocentric epoch. From the name to the plane, not in our name, we shout and recall that Derrida writes of La Guerre des Noms Propres, the War of Proper Names. From the name to the plane and from the stone to the drone. Something about weapons and the inadequacy of our understanding is making its presence felt today, which seems to demand a rethinking of novelty and of technology, of philosophy and of science. The violence of the letter, the inscription of destruction, is at the historical origin and structural possibility of philosophy as of science, the condition of the episteme. And it is beginning to lay hold on world culture, while science in its advancement can no longer be satisfied with it. It is well known, or should be well known, that Derrida questions the very possibility of a positive science of writing, a grammatology. 
as he evokes such science and interrogates the novelty of the age, a novelty that cannot be translated into clear-cut clear -cut notions of mutation, exploitation, accumulation, revolution, or tradition. Derrida reminds us that novelty and innovation are not to be privileged. He reminds us of what David Edgerton calls the shock of the old. Later, much later, Derrida returned to the matter, explaining how he would be speaking this time of political theology and of the religion of the death penalty. Something he saw as pointing us toward those very numerous apparatuses, sorry, I'm reading Derrida now, those very numerous apparatuses for legally putting to death that men have ingeniously invented throughout, throughout the history of humanity as history of techniques, techniques for policing and making war, military techniques, but also medical, surgical, anesthesial techniques for admis administering so-called capital punishment." End of quote. I just want to make clear that uh, what Derrida is actually raising as a question, which he formulates in an interesting way, is the uh, fact that uh, even today when the death penalty is being abolished in all kinds of places, although thankfully not in the United States because let's be serious, uh, um, there is uh, no state that has actually relinquished the uh, right to kill, right? to kill its own citizens, other citizens, people that it deems non-citizens, etc. And by making that connection, he raises the question of where to look for weapons, whether we should be looking for weapons on the military side or whether, in fact, any means of destruction, any uh, weapon, any um, uh, death-dealing machine, uh, mm -hmm. like the gas chamber, which actually was invented in the United States as a means of killing human beings in 1924, something that I was surprised to find out. Then again, we knew that the Nazis had borrowed quite a bit from the United States. A science of weapons, even a study of the social life of weapons, in other words, would not, would not restrict itself to matters of war and militarism. It would also have to attend to crime and to punishment, to the word and to the sword, the noose and electric chair, and the gas chamber too, actually first adopted by Nevada in 1921. It would attend to the killing, a science of, of weapons would attend to the killing of animals and to the evolution of the slaughterhouse, a science of weapon of weapons would finally engage with weapons as a continuation, but also as the destruction of politics. Then again, then and again, Derrida alerted us to the possibility and impossibility of a generalized hoplology, from the Greek word for weapon, hoplos. What then is a weapon? Incidentally, between warfare and lawfare, the Cain episode carries us further into the field. Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, dot, dot, dot. Offering the surprising figure of a god who otherwise notorious in his inclination for capital punishment, radically stays the execution of the first murderer. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, God tells him. To which the condemned, anticipating a likely and still fatal outcome, responds, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Anyone who meets me may kill me. Not so, says God, showing himself a great comforter as well as a committed believer in the power of deterrence, or if need be, vengeance. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who came upon him, who came upon him would kill him. The stay of execution seems to have worked for Cain, depending on what working means, but the apocalypse implied therein, the earth being rather less than overpopulated at the time, was no more than postponed. That same God does, after all, soon reveal himself the inventor of the first weather weapon, the ultimate WMD. Repenting for his earlier clemency or unleashing an anger to which he had failed to give a more timely and healing outlet, God does not hesitate this time to execute and unleash deadly hydrogen-based waves and meteorites upon the entirety of his creation. What Peter Sloterdijk calls the terror of our time has thus been in place for some time. 
It has long consisted in the knowledge of an elimination that passes through a theory of the environment, the strength of which is that it enables the terrorist to understand his victims better than they understand themselves. Call it creative destruction. We shall go back to that. One that implicates the sovereign and the criminal, the emperor and the pirate, the city and the terrorist. For what of God's flood and of his blood? And what of the weapon? Does not the death penalty represent, this is Derrida speaking, the death penalty represent a divine, a divine weapon granted by the sovereign God to the sovereign monarch to fulfill a providential law? And of course, the first murder and its aftermath would justify for some being equally fascinated to the point of merging them or reminding us of their profound resemblance or even of their essential collusion with the weapon of the crime and the weapon of the capital punishment. Between the animal and the divine, the natural and the technological, the inhuman and superhuman, there may lie an explanation for the strange fact that this most divisive and decisive of human devices, or indeed series of devices, never made it into the list of the proper of man. Let me quote from um, Bernard Stiegler, who um, actually finds, um, actually I don't have the quote here, but, uh, you know, the proper of man, laughter, reason, speech, etc. Uh, weapons, for some reason, never made it. But if weapons are media, is it not the proper of man that must be reconsidered? As Friedrich Kittler puts it, if media are anthropological a priori, then humans cannot have invented language. Rather, they must have evolved, uh, evolved as its pets, victims, or subjects. But more on that anon. For now, let us note that unlike death itself, labor, oh, sorry, that's the Stigler quote. Death itself, labor, education, language, society, love, which would be proper to man, right? These have all been claimed by different philosophers to be the proper of man. The weapon is by no means so, though it is the means, no doubt, by which man makes himself a man's man, I mean, and a means of destruction or perhaps of obstruction. For the weapon is indeed defensive, just as it is offensive. A weapon, strictly put, is on the fence. A fence, which is also a weapon, offense or defense. Fence derives from findere or fendere, to split apart, cleave, divide, etc. Used mostly in compounds and economical in many ways, the substantive fence refers to the act of defending or to means of protection. It is also the action, practice, or art of fencing, or use of the sword. Hence, to make fence is to assume a fencing attitude, and one can be, as Hobbes knew well, a master of fence. A means to an end, then, from beginning to end. But then again, what is not a weapon? What is it, under such condition, that can manage not to serve destructive or terrifying ends and escape the definition of a weapon. The end of the book and the beginning of writing. Theodor Adorno had it that there could be found between the lines, as it were, universal history. Universal history, Adorno writes, must be construed and denied. After the catastrophes that have happened, and in view of the catastrophes to come, it would be cynical to say that a plan for a better world is manifested in history and unites it. Not to be denied for that reason, however, is the unity that cements the discontinuous, the discontinuous, chaotically splintered moments and phases of history, the unity of the control of nature, progressing to rule over men, and finally to that over men's inner nature. No universal history leads from savagery to humanitarianism, but there is one leading from the slingshot to the megaton bomb. It ends in the total menace which organized mankind poses which organized mankind poses to organized men in the epitome of discontinuity. In Kittler's word, the classic rift between the production and reception of books is replaced by a simple, by a single military interception. The title of this section comes from an ad um, which has um, uh, Mark Hamill, the actor, which I saw in New York somewhere, and uh, the, the ad uh, says, I am my own secret weapon. And it's actually a, an ad to fight cancer. Because as you know, uh, if you have cancer, then you um, 
have to go to war with it or something. I, I couldn't understand what the hell that was saying, but it was an interesting ad. So perhaps the question to consider should be instead, who is a weapon? Was not Cain the first murder weapon? Without getting too attached to the old Germanic term, we may never, nevertheless note that the word bears this kind of personalized scrutiny, which used to mean one skilled in the use of a weapon, as the OED lists it. Besides, the author of that precarious doctrine of man as homo inermis, John Johann, sorry, Johann Gottfried Herder, averse that it has often been said that man was created defendless, defenseless, verlos. But this is not true. He has weapons for defense like all other creatures. After all, Herder continues, what animal has the multifarious implements of art which he possesses in his arms, his hands, the mobility of his body, and all his faculties? Art is the most powerful weapon. Kunst is das stärkeste Gewehr. And man is still art. He is altogether, altogether, listen to this expression, one organized weapon of defense. Er ist gan kunst, ganz und gar organisierte Waffe. End of quote. Man, Herder surprisingly hurries to qualify, I quote again, was designed to be a mild, peaceable creature. He was not intended to be a cannibal. Herder, one might say, shrank back from, his, from this unknown root, from the form and force of the ultimate weapon system as defensive and offensive at once. Freud, who was never big on the distinction between offense and defense, but knew something about the difference between being and having, not to mention smoking, referred to the later, latter as a protection and a weapon in the combat of life. He was referring to his smoking. Something remains still that should enable us to ask whether sometime a weapon is just a weapon. Perhaps to ask again after the first weapon. After all, the weapon as subject required the corresponding brain. Was it not Cain himself who, depriving himself of ground and strictly speaking, verlos, proceeded to stand and kill his brother? Between self-defense and autodestruction, weaponry is a self-liquidating fact, writes McLuhan. Who really now is the first weapon, the first suicide weapon? For to wield a weapon, Alan Feldman reminds us, is literally to take one's life in one's hand. Still, Ian Hacking insists that the point of the suicide weapon is to kill or harm an enemy, not the self. At the very least, he says, that we ought to conceptualize the suicide weapon not only under the category of suicide, but also under the category of weaponry. I'm not sure who hacking, hacking is actually arguing against, but... At the same time, Hacking vehemently disputes the claim that the suicide weapon must be as old as the human race or older, that it is a part of a system of animal survival. One dies knowing that one is bound to be killed in defense or attack in order that kin or clan shall survive. Hacking's turn to history and to the book goes back to the Christian prohibition against suicide. He mentions David and Goliath as an instance of asymmetric warfare. His history of weaponry is considerably shorter, though. He deploys, at any rate, the arsenal of statistics and other sciences to make the surprisingly banal and banalizing assertion that, I quote, if there is one human universal that is plausibly explained by evolutionary psychology, it is the fact that most acts of violence in all cultures at all times are committed by young males between the ages of 16 and 25. End of quote. I propose to narrow down this large chunk of population and ask whether the first suicide weapon was not one of two young men between the ages of 16 and 25, or perhaps it was both of them. So was it Samson or Leonidas? And maybe, if this come with a timer device or a delayed fuse, it was Socrates all along. Think of what was fragmented and destroyed in the history of philosophy and well beyond it, long, long after this ticking bomb took himself out and many more with him. I counted at least one chicken. And think of Judith, think of Medusa or of Medea. What tradition is this? 
What inscription of destruction? Was this Athens or Jerusalem? Sparta or Gaza? It might seem strange to begin again and as such suspenseful moment by asking about hair. Hair as a weapon. Hair as the earliest weapon. Darwin does include the loss of hair in his discussion of the defenselessness of man, something he says would not have been a great injury to primordial man if he inhabited a warm country. Adriana Cavarero, for her part, reminds us of Medusa and Medea as she registers the pertinence of hair, its sensitivity, as it were, in the experience of horror, the bristling of the hair on one's head. I do not think I need to remind you of Samson's hair, famously sheared by Delilah. For before the donkey's jawbone with which he slew a thousand men, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. It was hair, of course, that was Samson's most essential weapon. And so, it seems, was the Spartans. As they were spied upon by Circe's envoy, Herodotus writes, their arms and armor lay in front of the wall, and he was able to take stock of them. He watched them in a variety of occupations, such as exercising, make, and combing their hair. This surprised him. Granted, this was not an easily readable moment, and Circes, therefore, could not understand that in actual fact the Greeks were getting themselves ready to kill or be killed to the best of their ability. Demeratus obligingly translates, These men have come to fight us for the pass, and they are getting ready to do just that. It is their custom to do their hair when they are about to risk their lives. And risk they did, but they were not going to go down alone. Persian casualties would be high. For the Greeks knew they were going to die at the hands of the Persians who had come around the mountain, and so they spared none of their strength, but fought the enemy with reckless disregard for their lives. Leonidas knew what he was doing, acting according to the oracle at Delphi, who had predicted that either Lacedaemon would be laid waste by the Persian, or their king would die. So he fought and he fought, and the 300 along with him, until, I quote Herodotus, they regrouped, and all, except the Thebans, pulled, past, pulled back past the wall to where the road was narrow, where they took up a position on the spur, that is, the rise in the pass which is now marked by the stone lion commemorating Leonidas. Here the Greeks defended themselves with knives, if they still had them, and otherwise with their hands and teeth, while the Persians buried them in a hell of missiles, some charging at them head-on and demolishing the wall, while the rest surrounded them on all sides. Books of mass destruction, I said, and I did not even mention Achilles or quote the Iliad or the, on the fall of Troy, the Bible on the, on the destruction of Sodom. We will go to another city instead, to Gaza, where Samson returned again and again, and where he lost his sight, where he also lost and regained his hair. Our God has given Samson our enemy into our hand, said the Philistine, somehow prematurely, after they brought him down to Gaza. I quote the Bible, when the, when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, call Samson and let him entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison and he performed for them. They made him stand between the pillars and Samson said to the attendant who held him, who held him by the hand, let me feel the, feel the pillars on which the house rests, so that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, and on the roof there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, Lord God, remember me and strengthen me only this once, O God, so that with this one act of revenge I may pay back the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. He strained with all his might, and the house fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So those he killed at his death were more than those he had killed during his life. End of quote. 
Just as with the Spartans, we are led to witness the making and unmaking of a human weapon, an act, as Tal al-Assad explains, of auto-destruction. One might argue over the guilt or innocence of the targets of the act, indeed one might ask about the chains of doers and deeds hinted at in both texts, prophecy and oracle, divine and human, not to mention the animal, lion or donkey, city and soldier, knowledge and power. These are coming together in the making of the first human bomb, the suicide bomber, a super weapon. Before the city on a hill, let me just pause. Um, one of the interesting things about discussions of suicide bombing, which aside from the movie by Avi Mugrabi, For My Two Eyes, um, I haven't seen mention, is the fact that um, there's a state in the Middle East that has actually introduced the idea not of a suicide bomber, but of a suicide state. Um, and as far as I know, this is quite old. I don't know how, f uh, how old the notion of the Samson option is, but the state of Israel um, uh, has long planned to exercise the nuclear option, and it has called it the Samson option, um, which of course works very well with the Masada complex, but then there's still a question of what it means to introduce a state that is a, um, a suicide state, something that is very distinct from every other state, which as Richard Talk actually uh, documents, every state has um, uh, taken in its constitution the undermining of any possible possibility of democracy including democracy, but not only democracies, when states have inscribed in their constitution the uh, necessity of self-preservation, which takes, uh, takes precedence over any principle, right? over any principle. So um, at the moment of emergency, the moment of emergency right, is actually at the foundation of every state. And Israel may, after all, be an exception, although I hesitate usually to grant that, but it may be an exception precisely because it actually includes in its very um, uh, conception of, of the self, in fact, the possibility of its uh, destruction, self-destruction. Before the city on the hill engage in its own race for the super weapon, before we Americans devise mechanisms capable of wiping out our own nation, global civilization, and possibly the human species, before all that, the power of the myth, Sparta and Gaza, has also lent itself to various modern projects, secular and, religi and religious, and has been used in numerous works, operas, poems, paintings, novels, and movies in the history of Western art. I'm quoting Talal Assad, sorry. The spectacular final act of suicide and destruction is art, or at any rate, the aesthetic performance of an idea. End of quote. Samson and Leonidas, these are no doubt heroes, self-sacrificing heroes, but they are also, and perhaps first of all, weapons. They are themselves mechanisms that mix the stone and the drone, announcing and denying at once the fulfillment of the ancient desires that inspires the whole history of ballistic weapons to increase one's reach so as to hit the enemy from a distant distance before the opponent can launch its own attack. Samson and Leonidas operate as divine and popular swords. They are at once actors and instruments. They are time bombs, missiles that have been launched on their course from some prior afar. They remind us that, as Foucault put it, the sword that punished, punished the guilty was also the sword that destroyed enemies. It is true that with drones, the weapon's range, the distance between the weapon and its target, has been increased by the range of the remote control, the distance separating the operator from the weapon. It is true also that thousands of miles can now be interposed between the trigger on which one's fingers rest and the cannon from which the cannonball will fly. But it is also true that as one begins to reread past writing according to a different organization of space, as Derrida had it, the distance that separates the oracle from the spectacle and the weapon from the imagination, the city from its defender and God from the hero's, gods from the hero's strength, that distance appeared to acquire non-Euclidean attributes. I shall conclude somehow abruptly with Eyal Weizmann, who recently provided an account that brings us back to Gaza as well as to the ground, the ground from which rises the fence, the offense or defense of the fence, which is to say the wall, or what Weizmann calls warfare. I quote, The wall could not, of course, be reduced merely to its physical structure and its root. It is, it is a heterogeneous and intervowing 
interval and assemblage of interconnected systems of fortifications, architectural constructions, the terminals, sensing technologies, automatic weapons, aerial, and in the case of Gaza, marine systems that are operated by a multiplicity of institutions according to ever-changing administrative procedures, calculations, tactics, ethical, legal, and humanitarian propositions that capture something of the meaning of what Foucault referred to as an apparatus, and of quote. Such would be the question of weapons, which is also, Derrida suggests, the great question of the state, or, as I have been referring to it, the city, in its relation to means of inscription and means of destruction. For, Derrida says, if capital punishment is di distinct from murder, from crime, from assassination, or from vengeance, because universal reason, the third party, the anonymity or the neutrality of state law intervenes, the question remains as to where the state begins. Which is, I think, another way to ask, what is a weapon? Where and when does it begin or end? Thank you. Somebody has that the first question. And, and, and I have quite a stupid question, partly because I was late. To be um, but so I'm just doing this to get things going. <laughs> <laughs> How, uh, how much difference do you make between uh, Sparta and Gaza? Yeah. In other words, be between the story of Leon and and the, the story of Samson. Right? The truth, I don't know yet. I don't know yet. Uh, uh, I mean, obviously, I'm playing both with, uh, uh, with the other tradition, right? The one that we, maybe we're not so proud of, Athens and Jerusalem. Um, um, I mean, that one we are proud of, apparently. I am not i sure why, but anyway. Um, um, but I'm also playing with a historical trajectory, yes? Um, and I don't know yet what, what, the, what that difference might, might be. Uh, I think in, certainly in this uh, part of the project, which is kind of the first uh, uh, part, um, I think I'm being a little too Heideggerian, right? It was all there from the beginning kind of thing. Um, but, but I think there might be some virtue uh, to that in order to kind of open the question, uh, at which point uh, um, do we consider um, um, means of destruction, right? The flood, uh, uh, Sodom, Sparta, Gaza, um, and, um, and what it actually might mean to, to bring those together in order to actually look at, at them and then start making distinctions, which, uh, which in political terms seem to be uh, missing. Uh, I should say that one of the impetus for, the, uh, uh, for this work has been uh, the surprise that I've felt, which is not fully confirmed because uh, I haven't been able to check everything, but for the most part it seems that political philosophers, whatever we call those, have not been interested in the question of weapon, and I found that really stunning. Um, it's, uh, it seems to be an important question. Uh, George Orwell, as I mentioned to a few uh, who have been uh, here is uh, is uh, is as far as I know the one the first one who produced uh, a formulation that seems to make sense, namely, for example, is there a difference between uh, democratic weapons and fascist or totalitarian <coughs> weapons? And that's a question that seems important to ask, but, um, but that I haven't found. Um, asked. Yeah, yes. Um, so I think that the question of um, the theological thread throughout um, the paper that you just gave us. And not that the thread, but sort of thinking about the weather working, thinking about the flock. Um, all the way to the end with the question of capital punishment, where you are, where does that state enter? And I take it that this is where does the state begin? And I take it that this is, I don't know, this is where you're you're going to continue to investigate. I'm asking whether this is an attempt then, with this last question, whether this is an attempt then to make distinctions that you are not tracing in the paper um, that would then emerge, that emerge, that question emerges at the end, so that's question number one. And question number two, in relation to this destruction that is divine versus human or state um, led. Um, it's, then this is slightly complicated, the question, so I'm going to, you, have, you're going to, you might have to bear with me. 
Um, so the ways I think about earthquakes versus what is their destruction, that's the question. So, um, and one, I wondered whether you had something in between, between the theological, the divine, and then the human state. In between, there is the natural, right? There is then the rise of the natural sciences, and the nature then begins to have its own forces. And it always, I was always fascinated by that relationship of the natural taking the place of the theological, and then the political catastrophe or the political destruction. I wondered whether you had thoughts on that. So these are two questions. They're general, but I think the first one is perhaps more related to what you're doing. If you could explain more for us the way you trace the divine theological destruction in relation to the human one throughout the paper, and then the last question, where does the state begin? And what does it do to, to that narrative that you gave us throughout? I mean, it's interesting that you call it, uh, I mean, that you refer to the natural. Uh, I think the distinction that, uh, I mean, one moment that interests me most is, uh, is the sense that weapons are technological. To the extent that military historians and, 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 uh, and um, scholars of technology have dealt with weapons, for the most part, uh, uh, the discussion, at least uh, insofar as I have seen, is that technology is human or post-human. And uh, whatever the anthropocentrism of the assertion whereby one could say that animals have weapons too, um, even if it is anthropocentric, the, the, the mimetic relation, which begins from the very beginning, right, the use of teeth and bones, etc., uh, um, the, the relation between the human and the animal, as far as the thinking of weapons, as far as the imagination of weapons, all the way to drones that look like hummingbirds and, and spiders, etc., is, um, seems to me to be something that needs to be interrogated. What would it mean to consider that the animal is also, and perhaps that goes in the direction you're asking, what would it mean to consider that nature is armed? Um, is it metaphorical or is it not? Are we um, an effect of nature? Should we think our capacity for destruction as, uh, as an extension of nature, right? Uh, kind of over against McLuhan, who says that weapons are extension of man. How about weapons, uh, or human beings as weapons, are extension of nature? Uh, obviously, I, don't, I, I wouldn't want to necessarily land on that, but it seems to me that in order to open the question, one needs to consider that. Now, certainly, in historical terms, I, th I think, um, I think it's, it has become uh, increasingly difficult to make the distinction between natural disaster, disasters and political disasters, uh, if only because of the politics of construction, uh, ur urban development, and, uh, uh, and whatnot, right? And we see where most of the destruction is when the tsunami hit, et cetera. There's a, a kind of distribution of, uh, um, of, um, of destruction that is not, uh, that cannot be seen as natural. Uh, so the question is, um, as my teacher, Avital Ornel, once put it, can we criticize natural destruction? Can we criticize uh, 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 natural catastrophe? Uh, and and per perhaps we have come to the place where we should, um, but then we also need to ask back. Um, what distinctions then need to be made uh, rather than taken for granted, uh, which seems to me to be the, 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 the situation now when thinking about weapons and means of destruction, rather than take for granted that we actually either know what we are talking about or uh, consider, um, consider uh, weapons just as instruments, something that some states use in some cases or whatever. Um, I was struck, for example, uh, uh, by uh, a moment where Bruno Latour comes together with the Second Amendment and when he imagines uh, the question of weapons, uh, and the question of guns, all you can imagine is one man, one gun. And that's really very striking because it's been a while that guns are not just the effect of one person, uh, even if they are wielded by one person, right? They're the result of assembly lines that were actually invented in this country. Before Ford, the Americans invented the assembly line for weapons. Um, so there's a political question uh, uh, that seems to me to be uh, urgent. And it's true that at this point, I'm more interested in kind of undoing the, the distinctions that we are, or, or not undoing, I don't think I'm undoing anything, but kind of suspending distinctions that we may take for granted in order to ask, well, what, what is a weapon and where does it start? Is nature the first weapon? 
Um, and uh, that goes as well for the question of the state. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to say all states are the same. I do think that, for example, this, this, the, uh, this history that Tuck traces whereby states become, um, right, the abolition, for example, of the right to kill the tyrant, uh, uh, which I believe Hobbes is to blame for, um, is, uh, is a moment where the state makes itself into that which must be preserved and as a result becomes a very particular kind of machine or organon or whatever. So distinctions need to be made, but, uh, but perhaps at this point it's important to suspend them because we may have taken a, a little too many for granted. Does that? Yeah, yeah. no, I was just yeah. um, Thank you, Bill, for that um, provocative uh, talk. So I, I got a better sense of, of the larger project as you were answering um, Sandra. And I wanted to go back to your um, discussion of Samson and Masada, particularly as you mentioned moving on by two eyes. And what's interesting about the staging of, of Samson and that, and the, I mean, it's not staging, it's a documentary, so it's actually trying to show what, how Samson and Masada are used in the contemporary state of Israel. Uh, it's very hard for me to see the similarity across the, the, the initial uh, sort of, you know, the, the event that you described mm -hmm. and the, the, the use to which it was put. And, um, and it's interesting that I'm saying the event and then I'm talking about its use because that seems to me one of the problems of trying to think uh, what you're trying to get us to think about. Mm -hmm. You know, that there is an event and that its deployments in various different constellations is what allows for the potential to be elaborated. That's one of the most habituated ways of think for us to think about uh, the problem that you're stating. And I had a sense that you were pushing against that. And I want you to just spell it out because you know the the if you think of uh, uh, said suicide bombing, which you also mentioned, one of the ways in which that argument unfolds, uh, the architecture of that book is that suicide bombing is itself um, is, is not the event. That what is, what is really uh, happening there is the constellation of various kinds of unrelated things, sensibilities, uh, perceptions of oneself, one's relationship to the past and present, that make that event, that act, a, a particular kind of an act in our presence. And it's not exactly a, simply a historical genealogy, but it's the very architecture of the argument that allows us to enter that differently. And I'm just wondering what it means to us. Um, I, uh, I'm trying, uh, um, well, let me put it this way, even if I try not to, I, I, I think, uh, you know, every time I try to, get out, they put me back in. Uh, uh, that, that's my relationship to Derrida. Back? No, sorry, I, I was just quoting The Godfather 3. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> and that, the they in this case for me is Derrida. Uh, um, the event is, uh, um, uh, and the question that you're raising is the question of the saturability of context. Uh, because uh, even if one understands the assemblage that you're describing, right, the situation, it's a whole situation, so it's not just an event, it's, the, it's a certain perception, set of sensibilities, uh, interpretations, etc. Um, there is going to be a moment where one is going to have to decide what is text and what is context. And part of the, uh, uh, the, um, part of the lesson that I continue to learn from Derrida is uh, uh, over the, uh, the, um, the possibility of, in fact, determining a context. There is no way of actually saying the context ends here. Um, which is why Derrida says that the concept of context doesn't exist. Um, so, um, so the event uh, that I'm trying to, uh, which is why I'm referring to weapons as means of inscription and of destruction, um, is because it is a particular inscription in, uh, in something that could only vaguely be called a context. Um, and, and one of the, one of the uh, um, problems that I have in 
uh, in something that might, in fact, I thought Samara's question earlier was perhaps <coughs> a question about how to historicize. And one of the issues that I have is that history, at least since Vico, appears to have been understood as the history of action, of production, of agency, of doing, and of making. So what would it mean to actually go after, say, Zebald, yes, uh, 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 or for that matter, Benjamin, and to actually tell a history of destruction? At some level, it would be a history that would have to continuously um, vanish. Um, uh, certainly within the scheme of history as the history of action rather than the history of uh, destruction. But is this something you call a, a history? But you're doing, you're, but at least the paper as you presented it is really doing something else. Right, right. So why the compulsion to call it history? Not just on your part, on our part to have to hear it. Mm. What else is going on? No, no, I'm actually, I, am I? Uh, well, I, yeah, probably there's a, um, there is a, a certain compulsion I, as much as I uh, resist the call to historicize and get into trouble with my historian's friends. Um, I, um, I, it's not like I don't think there is such a thing. What? And that wasn't the question, and I didn't hear it. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I understand that. Um, is uh, um, I, I don't necessarily want to, to, to do a history, but I do, but I do uh, uh, understand that by bringing together moments that ha are seen to be of a widely diverging um, period, um, I might be, uh, and I, 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 I say that often, the problem in the university is that if one doesn't historicize, there's only one name for us, and it's uh, an essentialist. And I'd like to have a third option. Which is, which is my question, what is your option? Yes. Well, my option is to actually consider, consider the limit of the event that one might call a weapon, right? Uh, uh, um, and, and perhaps it's not an event, perhaps it's just a medium. Perhaps it's a way, in fact, of understanding certain events. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know yet. I don't have quite a definition. I have latched on that phrase of means of inscription and a means of destruction because of the insistence of Luke McLuhan, Derrida, and, uh, and a few others in linking the history of writing and the history of violence. Um, and, and, and then I'm kind of, and the expression means of destruction I pick up from Arendt, um, which has a nice kind of counter to Marx. Um, and, then, uh, and then I'm kind of waiting to see what happens once this is uh, at play. Yeah, I'm trying to keep track of it. And you, and then you, and then you. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a sort of version, but it picks up on the discussion that was, that was just happening about, about temporality. And um, I was curious about the juxtaposition of From the Stone to the Drone and Sparta and Gaza, because the subtitle I think of both of those talks is The Weapon is the Medium, right? So you're doing some. You're doing something, and, and so, so I was curious about the relationship between the and and the from, from, from the stone to the drone, Sparta and Gaza, right? And this question is coming in a lot of ways from thinking of your other work, Blood, Semites, and the Arab, which seem to be tracing not a genealogy, not a history, not a kind of periodization, um, not a series of events, but a logic of some sort, right? Um, so you're, I mean, the distinction, like your argument about Christianity seems to be one, it's not a, it's not a genealogical argument or historical argument, but about kind of a structural logic that endures. Mm -hmm. So that, that is what enables you to periodize differently. Um, and I'm just trying to track, and I, it's not a call, it's not that, you know, is this, a, is this a historiography, right, are you talking history, but rather really just trying to track what the, um, what the relationship is here in, in time, right, the end and the from, from the stone to the drone, Sparta and Gaza, and the, and the way in which you, you are clearly dealing with two very different <coughs> temporal periods, yet bringing them together in a particular way, and this is the other side of the question, I think what your work on Christianity does is to try to name the thing that refuses to name itself. And here, what it seems like you're doing a history of the human through the weapon, and yet obviously you're not. And so, could you name the thing that you're refusing to name? <laughs> not yet, but sure. you know. Well, uh, uh, doing right, but uh, um, uh, but I like the question. But as you recall, because earlier today we were talking about it, uh, um, if I if if I had an alternative career, which I don't think there really was an option, but if I had, it would have been a rapper. Uh, um, and um, so, 
So I think my answer is not, and, and that's true for, for uh, uh, the question of uh, uh, what you call the logic. I actually, I, I would almost tend to call it an illogic, but, but, but much more uh, uh, prosaically, I would actually call it a rhetoric, right? From the stone to the drum, uh, uh, from the bone to the bomb, uh, is not a history. It's not even necessarily a temporality. It's, uh, um, I almost want to say, it's poetry. And we know the relation between poetry and war, right? Uh, at least uh, um, those of us who have read uh, the Iliad, not because we wanted to, but because we had to. Uh, um, so that, that relationship is, um, but I do think that what I'm doing, if I had to give it a name, uh, uh, like even in disciplinary uh, terms, I would have to say rhetoric. Uh, and it is about uh, um, recognizing rhetorical um, uh, relations, um, perhaps bringing them out. Um, is it performing, doing, undoing? I'm, I'm not sure, but, uh, um, but I think I would call it, rather than a logic, I would call it a rhetoric. It's certainly the rhetoric of blood in Christianity that, uh, that mattered to me. Yeah. Um, this is a real question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, it, there's a third um, example of model, certainly from the Israeli case, that leads um, to the Warsaw Ghetto, which is exactly, which was exactly a, um, a, a suicide bombing. Uh, um, Mark Edelman, uh, the anti-Zionist leftist uh, head of the rebellion, uh, 40 years later said, we knew we were all going to die. Somehow they convinced us that it was better to die with a weapon in our hands. And I think that, that, I mean, he, he, he's reflecting on that very critically, um, rejecting that. But the, the way that, that the Warsaw Ghetto became the paradigmatic event of the whole Nazi genocide for Israeli culture I think explains uh, or opens up to the possibility of the Samson option uh, even more perhaps than Samson. Uh, so. Thank you. Yeah, I have to think about that. Uh, I, I, I'm hearing uh, Talbis' answer to that, yes. Um, um, if, uh, if they ask me to go like sheep to the slaughter, I'll go like sheep to the slaughter. Yeah. That's what I Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. 50 years later. Right. Thank you. I mean, I'm not sure I can respond to that. And, and obviously, that would make the, uh, um, everything um, so much uh, reader friendly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm going to ask a simple question. So, mine is the question about intimacy of killing the stone, and the drone is the intimate, the, the dehumanized, the state, that which doesn't speak for us. That speaks for something else. So can you speak about the difference between the intimacy of killing, which is sacrifice and suicide, and the other? I would call this a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> it was quicker than the others. <laughs> well, I, I mean, obviously, it's very important uh, uh, to make those distinctions. Um, but I'm at a point where I, I, I don't want to uh, maintain distinctions that seem... Uh, uh, the extension of the fluid in there. Yes. The extension point to the state. And yet it's the extension of the human. So there's something strange with technology... Well, not, I mean, area. not everything in McLuhan about the extension of man is also is re related to the state. He does make the, the, the connection between, uh, between the letter and empire. Uh, okay. Yes. But the violence Yes, it, it's, it's something that, I, um, uh, that I, I don't have another way of describing than to actually, uh, in spite of our um, um, garrulousness and, uh, and our ability as academics to produce new language, right? Uh, uh, something which I think we have to recognize is a total failure. Uh, my favorite example is when, uh, uh, when uh, difference uh, which shouldn't be pronounced differently, but nonetheless is. When Difference makes it into the French dictionary, as you know, Avital Ornel tells the story in a, in a documentary, uh, Derrida's mother goes, ja Jackie, Jackie, you spell Difference with an A? Don't you know how to spell? Um, the, the failure of, of, uh, of, in fact, establishing a new vocabulary 
um, is to, to my mind only comparable to, um, to the paucity of our vocabulary when it comes, for example, to violence. Reading discussions of violence, whether liberalism and violence, whether it's Zizek or whoever else uh, 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 I, I have had the privilege or lack thereof of reading, um, it's extraordinary how violence can be a slap to a child to uh, uh, a genocide and the destruction of, of the environment. And the fact that there's only one word that seems to be, uh, uh, that seems to impose itself, uh, a little like the question that you asked, right? Can we in fact, it's almost as if in this particular case, there is no distinction to be made between massively different levels of violence, as if, as if there's no political dimension to violence, or as if, again, the, the, the violence of a parent to a child is to be compared to the violence of a state or an empire. Um, so I do want to look for distinctions, and I think they are essential. But I'm also puzzled by the fact that uh, we also lack a certain vocabulary in, in spite of the fact that we insist on certain distinctions. How can you compare? Yes. Um, uh, nonetheless, we, uh, uh, we, we lack vocabulary. So at, at some level, I'm kind of trying to sit between two chairs here. And uh, um, now I'm not saying anything about, um, about intimacy. Uh, and that might be because um, uh, Stefania, who told me she couldn't come, uh, uh, pointed to this movie, 5,000 5, Feet is, uh, is the Best. Um, and I have to say, I really have to think about the question uh, uh, of, of intimacy um, with regard to the drone. I, I don't know quite what to make. Shamayu makes the argument, uh, I think we were talking about this, about the fact that um, um, it seems possible in terms of uh, an interesting co coincidence that it was after drone strikes uh, got a little too much press and, and that video games were uh, uh, used for comparison, which is of course highly justified since these are the same uh, uh, consoles. Um, the, uh, um, the sense that in fact it was possible to use the drone and be completely oblivious to in fact the, the devastating effect. Um, at that very moment when it became a question, uh, PTSD got uh, uh, mentioned in the news and it turned out that uh, drone pilots were suffering too, which is why uh, some of them got, you know, the Purple Heart, uh, which the infantry didn't really like. But nonetheless, it worked. And so mm -hmm. drone pilots can get a Purple Heart for their actions, which suggests that the distance is not sufficient, or the lack thereof, <laughs> is not sufficient to define the intimacy of killing. Um, and so we seem to be losing our, our bearings. And so I don't want to take for granted that there is a lack of intimacy. I also don't want to grant it. But, uh, um, but that is, I guess, the question. Um, so thank you. We have time for two more questions. If Sorry, I'll be shorter in answering. I have a naive question from a historian, but not about history. About vocabulary. Um, what do you think about the vocabulary? You invoked the Greek oplo uh, a yeah. few times, which I would also translate as arm. And as arm. arms, arms, arms right? yeah. and it's actually grammatically more versatile, right? Arm, um, opens manos, right? So, how, <coughs> how is this even a relevant question? I don't know, but it seems because you just said there's no other word for something else. That you, I'm, I'm wondering how would any of this be different if you brought the word arm in, and why in English is weapon what you want instead of arm? Yes. Um, um, yeah, actually, I, uh, uh, there's another kind of uh, work in progress, which is uh, on uh, on Hobbes and the fact that uh, Leviathan is uh, is uh, in the in the frontispiece is represented, in fact, as two arms, and 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 which arms are those, are those arms uh, uh, is a question, and um, and um, and the fact that we uh, we seem to be thinking about those arms in terms of the you know religious political, uh, uh, theological, secular, whatever divide. And what's interesting is that there are weapons on all sides, um, and, or perhaps arms. Uh, and, um, and in this case, it works, because it, it, it works very interestingly because, uh, because it's also in Hobbes, it's also about reading, in fact, and about con confronting uh, another self, right? Uh, Noskete uh, ipsum. Um, so I don't know. Uh, even there, the vocabulary is something that needs to be uh, 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 thought about. And I am playing, I mean, I am kind of wrapping, I think, you know, the, the word and the sword and, and, and those things, though it looks better in writing, um, this one. Um, but, um, 
but I don't know. But thank you. Uh, in English, at least, arm. I mean, in Greek, it doesn't work like this because arm is a different word from the word for weapon. But in yeah. English, it seems like your point about arms or weapons being an extension. Of right. I mean, in the Bible, for example, it's to raise one's hand. Right. To raise one's hand is 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 in fact to uh, uh, um, to commit murder. Um, so, um, so there's, there's all kinds of things that need to be thought precisely, in fact, uh, over the question of instrumentality, which is not at all granted. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I have actually a, a question and a comment. So the question is about uh, Latour. So you mentioned briefly, you know, Bruno at the end. So, and I agree with you that his discussion of the weapon is kind of silly. And, and super simple, right? When in fact, you would assume that given where it comes from, you could have come up with a much better example. So rather than one person, one gun, and also a, a weapon that you can toss in the river and it disappear, right? Uh, you would have thought that he would come up with an example about, say, somebody using the internet to bully somebody and, and, and push him or her to commit suicide or something. So where, you know, in a sense, the murder is infrastructural, so to speak, right? Where you have, you know, the, the actant and the actor, uh, you know, uh, creating a, a, a kind of a killing assemblage, right? So, but the question is, I agree with you with the stupidity of this example, but also that, you know, it seems that actor macro theory could uh, actually go a long way toward theorizing the weapon. So the question is why, why not? Why you don't do that? So and the and the comment is rambling, and you know that I, these days I'm I'm obsessing about you know about property, and so I was kind of riffing as a, you know along uh, a, you know with your talk. So um, about the issue about you know the inscription, the division, the fencing, the plowing, those are all things that are also connected to the establishment of property. So Romulus and Remus, they plow, you know, a, a, a mark, and that, you know, constituted uh, uh, Rome, right? Uh, a plow or a fence is a way to establish uh, property, right? To claim something from the public domain into private property. To cut an apple, think about a Lockean property theory, to take an apple off a tree, the act of cutting turns it into your property. Uh, the act of killing a wild animal makes it your property. Right? So, so cutting or drawing lines and separating is typically, you know, both in the modern U.S. law and Roman law, it's it's how you produce property. Right? So, and then not only you, but here the, the the question about the weapon, you know, in the case say of, of a wild animal. You don't need to kill the wild animal to make it yours. You can just block it. So, in a sense, property is stopping movement, which which can be also stopping life, right? But not necessarily. So, to, to jump to your example about the wall, you know, the, the the warfare through walls, right? That's also what property does. You don't need to kill an animal, a wild animal, to make it yours. You can just cage it. So, so I'm kind of fascinated. So you know, what, what I'm saying is that, of course, we all know plenty of stories about the violence connected to property. But your story, you know, your story of the, or actually, uh, not a story, your narrative about weapons maps over very nicely a narrative about property. Mm -hmm. So it's a comment. Well, but but, but <laughs> if, uh, if, uh, um, if the comment triggers anything, let me know. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, thank you. It's uh, um, it's just making me think that uh, uh, um, I mean, in um, you know, various uh, slightly megalomanic moments, um, uh, I, I I've been wondering about whether after the distinction, which may or may not be a historical distinction. In fact, I think it is more interesting if it is not read as a historical distinction that Foucault makes between coercive power and productive power, um, whether one needs to actually grant relative integrity to destructive power, um, right, as a third mode. 
And if one were to do so, uh, uh, and in a way that wouldn't be kind of Schumpeter-like, right, that it's all about creative destruction, so some creation, some destruction, and vice versa, uh, not to, to, uh, to examine a, a, a constitutive, as it were, or, or deconstitutive moment of destruction in places um, I mean, one of the uh, moments I have, it's not related to property, but it's, uh, uh, it's Ivan Illich on the iatrogenic effect of medicine, right? Medicine, in fact, as, uh, as a killing machine, rather than as the healing machine that we have taken it to be. Certainly modern medicine, in Illich's argument. So to actually look for means of destruction, witting, unwitting, this is not what matters, um, in, in, uh, in, different, um, in different sites. And uh, I suppose that's part of, the, of keeping things open for now because I really, I have no idea what a weapon is. Um, I, um, so it might be, uh, and I'm, I'm quite certain from the, uh, from the lock that I have read, that it might be quite possible to make an argument that property is not only uh, creating, producing destruction, right, unleashing violence, but actually that it is a mean a means of destruction in itself. And what would it mean then to consider it that way? And then, uh, um, and obviously then start making distinctions between kinds of property, et cetera. Now, it, it, uh, just for um, ANT, um, only because of the rhetoric of agency. Um, I, I, I'm staying away from, uh, I want to try to stay away from, from the fact that everything is an actant. And, uh, um, and I, I think that we have to consider the possibility that there, I don't know if it's a different kind of subject, if subject even fits, um, but something else that cannot be called an agent, that cannot be called a subject, um, that certainly cannot be called an actant, uh, uh, an agent. I mean, that's also why I play with, you know, is Samson an instrument or is he the thing itself or is it in fact the city that is the agent and uh, et cetera. Um, it's, it's part of actually parsing the, like the, the grammar, as it were, uh, of it all. What, what is the sender? What is the message? What is the addressee? I don't know. And, and uh, Derrida put death here, here, and here, um, uh, which may be a little too uh, universal, not necessarily wrong for that, but a little too universal and still needs to be parsed. And so that's what, uh, so thank you. I mean, um, Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.